Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this conversation on evangelicalism and writing about evangelicalism. My name is David Bratt. I'm a literary agent and publicist with BBH Literary, where we're handling publicity for Daniel Silliman and his book, Reading Evangelicals, How Christian Fiction Shaped a Culture and a Faith. In my former professional life as executive editor at Erdman's Publishing, I had the privilege of acquiring the book, so I'm happy to see it out in the world and on the cover of Christianity Today's October issue. Daniel is here with us on screen. We think you're going to enjoy what he has to say. We're also joined by Kristen Dumay, author of Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation, which has recently enjoyed a richly deserved position on the New York Times bestseller list. You've probably heard of Kristen's book. You may well have read it. Maybe you read it because it was describing a part of your life. Maybe you were one of many who had to read I Kissed Dating Goodbye or Wild at Heart. If you did, and if this was before Amazon ruled the earth, you probably had to go to a Christian bookstore to find it. Maybe while you were there, you were also steered toward the chaste passions of Amish romance or the supernatural thrillers written by Frank Peretti or Tim LaHaye. That's the world Daniel's written about the blockbuster bestsellers of Christian fiction and the bookstores they and their readers inhabited. Reading those books, going to those bookstores, Daniel says, those experiences were formative for evangelicals and understanding them is important for understanding evangelicalism. Kristen has gamely agreed to join us today to get in front of her computer camera yet again to talk about evangelicalism on the condition that this time she gets to be the one asking the questions. She has agreed to interview her friend Daniel Sullivan about his book and about their shared challenges writing about this religious movement that has shaped so many lives. So Kristen and Daniel, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks Kristen. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to jump right in because yes, it's, it's kind of thrilling for me to be the one who gets to ask most of the questions <laughs> here. And um, it's also a special privilege for me to get to be in conversation with Daniel because I have been a huge fan of Daniel's work uh, for years now. And uh, I think I first encountered your work uh, maybe at academic conferences, Daniel. Uh, the AHA, CFH, perhaps, and uh, your your work uh, insights in 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 terms of Christian publishing and Christian bookstores was really formative for my own thinking and uh, and for the writing of Jesus and John Wayne. So um, so I owe you a debt, a uh, scholarly debt, and I am um, really eager to uh, to welcome your book into the world. Uh, so Thank maybe you. we could just yeah just start with um, where. Where the idea came to you, how did you know you needed to write about evangelical fiction? <laughs> I do, you know when, you know when you know. I mean, to a certain extent, you, that means you don't know until you're well into it, in my experience. Um, I do remember one morning, my wife came out and I was drinking coffee and reading left behind and she said wait what's going on I don't understand um and I'm like oh I think I'm working on a project um yeah it started it kind of has two origins I think um one from my experience in Christian bookstores I just spent a lot of time as um someone growing up um in religious spaces, in confused religious upbringing, um, deciding where I fit in the world, in bookstores generally, in Christian bookstores in particular. So I always sort of had this sense that there was something that yeah, I needed to understand the space of the Christian bookstore. And then in grad school um, at the University of Heidelberg in Germany, I did a like class presentation on um, left behind. And I was just explaining the apocalyptic theology. Like what is the, what is the beliefs behind this? What is the rapture? What is the tribulation? Who is the antichrist? Where does all this stuff come from? Um, and my professor who became the supervisor of my dissertation, um, great historian named Jan Steverman, just asked me, but why is it fiction? 
like why didn't they write a tract why didn't they write a, um, a theological book I mean I get what the theology is but why is it important to the author or the readers or somebody like why write it this way and I thought that was um I didn't know, and I thought that was a really compelling question. So those were kind of the two starting points for me. Why, why is this theology written as novels? Um, why is this worldview presented fictively? And then what's going on with the Christian bookstores? Why, why are they the way they are? I spent plenty of time in my own local Christian bookstore uh, growing up, and it makes a cameo appearance in the conclusion to your book, Sioux Center, Iowa, True Vine. So shout oh. out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, did you know immediately uh, th these five books, uh, the, this is, they have to be in here or, or did winnowing down the list involve some really painful choices? Yeah, it took me, it took me a little time. My first thought was to do a chapter per genre. Um, so I'd have like a romance genre and then an apocalyptic genre and stuff. Um, I found that the, the academic scholarship on what a genre is was more than I wanted to deal with. <laughs> I got a little lost in that. It was like, this isn't helping me. Um, so I backed out of that a little bit. Um, and then, and then I started, what I honed in on was the combination of um, a book that was really, really popular. So each of these five sold more than a million copies and that marked some kind of transition. So it was either the first of that type of book or, or more importantly, um, it, 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 it showed publishers and booksellers a kind of different way to market novels or a different market to reach. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that um, that ended up being the the criteria. That did leave a couple of things out um, that I really wanted to write about, and I thought they were great books or really interesting books. Um, Francine Rivers is huge and doesn't appear. And I think that's the biggest oversight because um, she's she's sort of very, very well done, very popular, very influential. But since I'd already written about Jeanette Oak, a lot of the themes in Francine Rivers were just already the themes I would would talk about. Um, though she's especially interesting because she was a professional romance writer before and then became a Christian writer and became a Christian and then started writing for the evangelical market. So if you compare the before and after, you can see very closely uh, what she thinks is translatable and what isn't. Um, yeah, and there are some other books too. There's, a really, there's some really good Christian crime novels that I think are interesting. Um, and then, you know, I have a chapter on Frank Peretti, but I didn't talk about the one that I personally find the most interesting, which is The Visitation. Um, which starts out, I don't know if you've ever read it, but it starts out with a burnt out pastor who's not quite an ex-evangelical, but like really he's done with <laughs> church, you know? And it ends with a street parade in this very pretty tight town with three Jesuses fighting, like literally full on brawling in the street. And I, that's, I don't, what else can you ask of a novel, but <laughs> yeah, but I didn't get to include that. You do have to, I mean, how you, as you know, however you, however you approach it, you have to make tough, tough decisions about what the logic of your book is going to be. Yeah, yeah, I wavered about, do I include Preddy or not? There's so much, and there's so much to be said, and I couldn't find a concise way to do it, but it, it does feel like a bit of a loss. Um, I, I will be uh, covering Francine Rivers in my next one, so we will oh, have to compare notes on that yeah, uh, at absolutely. some point. Yeah, um, so you... Um, had some familiarity with this literature. Is that right? You, you talked about kind of growing up in, in these religious spaces. Do you consider yourself an evangelical today? Do you, did you grow up in the evangelical world? How do you kind of position yourself with respect to your scholarship? Yeah, I did grow up with some familiarity, um, though not at the kind of the, I wasn't the target market for the evangelical bookstore. We were in a uh, sort of more extreme group that 
found other Christians deeply suspect and <laughs> and um yeah and I mean for me going to the Christian bookstore was a way to find out about other Christians like oh there's other people and that's interesting that they're into um yeah but I wasn't like the core audience or the exact you know youth group kid that they were sort of imagining mm -hmm. um I do consider myself an evangelical today um more after grad school than before in some ways I read myself into evangelicalism in a way that I guess is not the the most the most common it's it, it's it's actually really fascinating to me because I hear a lot of stories about evangelicals who went to graduate school and kind of read their way out of the tradition totally. uh, and 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 you were drawn in uh, can you speak at all to to what you were reading that that drew you into that space yeah and there was personal stuff too it wasn't just the reading um but i found within the very diverse tradition of evangelicalism i found a clarity and simplicity of the presentation of jesus that that i need and that i um have been further away from and felt drawn by and I felt yeah whatever else this this part of it really speaks to me in a in a deep way and really feels like it pulls me in um and then I would say secondly I just came to the I just came to the sense that these were my people and this is my history and that was going to mean that was going to mean not just celebrating the good parts, but also taking responsibility for some really terrible and evil things. And it didn't seem to me that um, like separating myself or moving away would um, reduce my complicity in any way. It seemed it felt more like an excuse or a, a washing my hands than it did an actual taking responsibility. Um, and then I would say the last thing, and this is the thing that maybe came across most clearly in my reading, it felt to me that one distinctive of the evangelical, the messy and broad evangelical tradition is a lack of gatekeepers. There's a, there's a deeply small d democratic um, aspect to it. And every time I was really tempted to say, oh, I'm not an evangelical because that person is saying that thing, I just felt these other voices in the history, you know, your crazy second grade awakening people, or even your, you know, your Pentecostals in the second half of the 20th century say, but that guy's not in charge. They, there's no synod, there's no bishop. <laughs> like, is that how you read the Bible? no so ignore him like that guy has nothing to do with you um and that to me that freedom of evangelicalism has been really important to my spirituality the fact that other people are free to say stuff um and yet that that sort of lack of an authoritative structure apart from what the holy spirit says how you understand jesus and how you read the read the bible um and maybe the market too, right? Well, and I think the market, um, yeah, the market, as far as how it positions you, how it connects you to other people. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the market is much more of a gatekeeper than, than most individuals. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have to, I have to ask a question now, because uh, a little bit ago, you, in the same sentence, used the word evangelical and distinctive. And so, you know, where, you know, where we have to go. Here. Yeah, that was a mistake. <laughs> I shouldn't have used the word distinctive. It's just there. Yeah. Oh, I was going to ask this question anyway. No, do so it. Go for it. We've, we've been throwing around the, the term evangelical as if we both yeah. totally know what we're talking about here. Exactly. Of course. <laughs> As historians of evangelicalism, uh, we know that uh, this is a contested word and that different scholars and evangelicals themselves are bringing different definitions to this word. Absolutely. Can you, can you say a little bit about how you 
uh, decided to define evangelical or to describe evangelical is maybe a better word and how you, uh, in through this book, wade into a little bit of that definitional territory. Yeah. I mean, I do think that's one of the like bigger fights that's happening and, 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 um, a lot of new scholarship is fighting exactly this fight, as you know, uh, and it was important to me to, to sort of push a little bit here. Um, for me, I want to shift from talking about like what an evangelical is in some sort of ontological sense to thinking about how evangelicalism is structured. Um, it's my sense that it's um, contested enough, um, messy enough, um, there's enough, la there's not enough authority to ever make it a single coherent thing. <laughs> we don't all agree there's no Pope um, and there really can't be. That's kind of, that's kind of, um, I don't want to say by design, but that's, that's um, how it has evolved. Um, so shifting from something like uh, they all read the Bible or they all take the Bible really seriously to um, here's, how, here's how people come together uh, in the bookstore. Here's how they buy their Bibles. Here's all the literature that they interact with, some of which they love and some of which they hate about, about the Bible. Here are the schools that they go to, that they meet at, and then have those other conversations. So I describe in the, in the intro about um, thinking, of, thinking of it as a conversation and a conversational community. And the subject of the conversation can change as time changes. Mm -hmm. I think the, that contingent element is really important to me. Um, but then what holds the conversation together if it's not the topic? Well, there are structural things. We all meet in this way. Here's who's invited to the table. Here's who has the power to say who's invited to the table. Here's who pretends to have the power <laughs> to say who's invited to the table. Um, yeah, so I try and move away from uh, here are four distinctives um, to, that, that are sort of the essential platonic truth of evangelicalism to a more, um, yeah, description of the structure. I think the book market is a hugely important structure, but it's definitely, and I try to make this really clear, and I'm not saying it's the only structure. I think there are a bunch of them that are sort of all operative. Definitely. Uh, so when we're thinking of, of these kind of definitions, who is an evangelical, how we conceptualize evangelicalism, uh, race frequently kind of uh, enters yeah. into this, this conversation. What insights uh, do you have from your study of, of Christian publishing, uh, evangelical fiction, Christian bookstores that can help us kind of understand how race plays into the identity of evangelicals? Is your book about about, uh, white evangelicals? Is it about evangelicalism writ large? How does, how does race kind of play into this story? I think the market and paying attention to book markets actually really helps us understand how evangelicalism is in most times, in most places, white evangelicalism. They're not always exactly the same thing. And it's not to say that, um, a minority person couldn't exist in those white spaces. But for the most part, when we talk about evangelicalism um, after World War II, we're talking about white evangelicalism. And I think the, the book market really helps explain how that happens because it's not theology that suddenly causes people to disagree about, I don't know, the nature of Jesus' sacrifice. You don't find that. Um, but what you do find is there's this great suburbanization that happens. Everyone moves to the suburbs. Well, not everyone. Certain people move to the suburbs. Yeah. Certain people are empowered by the, um, the market, by the government, by very uh, explicit policies to move to the suburbs and buy their own homes, um, as Darren Dochuk has written about so well. Um, and then following that, there are new commercial centers and there's credit that's available only in certain places, you know? So no Christian bookstore that I know of 
ever had a whites only sign. But it is the case that they only existed in predominantly white suburbs. Mm -hmm. And so they created a conversation and a network of conversation, mostly among white people. Yeah. At yeah. least um, at least to start. There, there's a there's an interesting sort of second part of that story of of um, of booksellers and publishers sort of intentionally um, trying to be inclusive and diversify mm -hmm. while not necessarily doing much to change the structure. It's more about like the titles and the authors and, yeah. and occasionally where books are sold. But. Oh, that makes sense. Um, because on the one hand, it, 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 it would make sense to try to expand that market, right? To uh, absolutely uh, <laughs> makes financial sense. Um, but as you say, without fundamentally kind of changing the product, changing the, the spaces uh, where, where the product is sold, it's really hard. And so it, it kind of uh, is, is self-defeating. Well, that book didn't sell very well, right? So let's stick mm -hmm. to what we know. Yeah. Yeah, and there's there's lots of cases of publishers sort of a going against their market incentives to try and publish stuff by black authors or Hispanic authors, um, but they don't actually have the ability to start bookstores in right. neighborhoods where the government doesn't extend credit to the banks to extend credit to new business owners, for example. So exactly. so that makes it a really complicated story that of course includes theology and of course includes politics, but is actually better explained at like a deeper level of just the structure of how we mm -hmm. connect to other people. Yeah. So, so Daniel, you are a historian and you are a journalist. It's true. <laughs> Do you do you find do you write in different ways uh, in in each role? Uh, do you find you can move very kind of seamlessly in between uh, when you're writing this book? Uh, were you intentional about crafting it in a different way than say you would write something for Christianity Today? Uh, how do you how do you kind of navigate that in your in your position as writer? This feels like the the Mark Knoll question to anyone who writes about anything after I don't know, 1950. He's like, We're how is journalists. this just We're not journalism? Journalists. Yeah, <laughs> yes. if there, yeah, what's the difference anyway? He would say, <laughs> um, I don't find there to be that much of a difference. I do, you know, for me, the biggest difference is that a a book is 280 pages <laughs> and a and a piece is just more condensed. But I am. Like I am always really interested in like constructing a narrative that shows people change over time, um, trying to challenge people to see the complexity of something that appeared simple before, um, challenging people to see the contingency of things that just seemed like they had to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, so the biggest, the biggest difference for me in writing um, history tends to be, tends to be length, I, I think. Yes. Um, yeah, readers may disagree. There may be other <laughs> people may say, no, this is totally different. Um, and they did end up being different sources. I mean, um, I didn't interview, I didn't interview the authors for the book. I mostly, I kind of just worked with like what's publicly available um, mm -hmm. records. I thought that um, that actually helped me sort of say, um, here's what's known. I hadn't discovered some secret information. Here's the, all mm -hmm. the stuff that's been out there for a while that we can then read closely and put together and talk about. But, yeah. but to me, they, they bleed together pretty well because I'm just trying to describe how things are and tell a story that sheds some light on how things are. Yeah. So, so the title reading evangelicals, love the yeah. title. Uh, it, did you, did you just like have that right off the bat or did that emerge at some point? How did you, how did you come that to that? Was, yeah, that was, um, that was David Bratt, my editor's uh, suggestion, which was great. Um, it has the, the dual function that this is a book about books, but it's also a book about people and understanding them through their reading. Mm -hmm. Um, but no, that didn't come to me. I tend to be really, I don't know how you are. I tend to be really good with titles for other people's stuff. <laughs> and then I'm so deep into my own stuff. I'm like, all I have is like 60 keywords, um, which yeah. are obviously not going to work. Um, 
Oh, this one worked. This one worked. Yeah, so. I'm really happy with how it how it came out. They also pushed me to do chapter titles. I originally just had like the name of each book for the oh, chapter, like yes, left behind, yes. you know, this, yeah, just a little <laughs> flag. Um, and they came back and said, it would help people to know. So that's great. It's why you need editors. And they're, they're really, Absolutely. Yeah. I, so, you, you know, thinking of, of reading evangelicals and thinking about, uh, you know, what, what can we learn from uh, about evangelicals uh, by looking closely at the books they read, and as you said, you know this isn't nonfiction. We're we're talking fiction here, mm -hmm. uh, and it's and it's 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 complicated, right? And and can you can you talk a little bit about uh, kind of the nuance necessary and and how we are able to kind of read fiction as texts as scholars. And, mm -hmm. and uh, what conclusions we're able to draw and what humility maybe we need to maintain in that there are, are, are many different ways that readers can receive text, can interact with text, this whole kind of uh, problem of reader response. Mm -hmm. um, how did you approach that in this book? In some ways, that was the, the methodological problem that was the most interesting. These texts exist, these novels are historical events I'm a historian, I should be able to interpret them. And what I found that a lot of people do, I mean, other historians, but journalists as well, is just this like really uh, easy, simple uh, move from, they would sort of interpret the book or say what the book was about. Then they would say how many people read it. And then they would say, and therefore 65 million people believed that the apocalypse was gonna happen any day. And it's like, and at first you read it and you're like, yeah, yeah. And then you start thinking about it. And you're like, wait, none of those people disagreed with this book? Have I, like you read, you're one of the people that bought the book. So, so, but that's easier to criticize than it is to come up with an alternative. Mm -hmm. um, the, the breakthrough for me was a, a Dutch American studies scholar named Ian Ang who wrote this amazing weird little book on the soap opera Dallas. It's called Reading Dallas or Watching Dallas, I think. Um, and it turns out that the soap opera Dallas was watched when it was on, was watched by like half the people in the Netherlands. Um, and all of the cultural explanations for the popularity of the show had to do with American culture. Hmm. And so she's just like, none of these are legit. None of these hold any water when you're talking about why a Dutch couple would love this show it can't be about the excess of american culture or the cold war or something um and so she did an audience study and starts looking at mass audience and how to sort of parse out the the differences between people who read something because they love it versus people who read something because they need to read it to talk to their their relative um versus people who hate read um and, and so I ended up, I ended up deciding that is like just a sort of base level claim that I was going to imagine that every book that had a mass audience would have three types of readers, readers who loved it completely, readers who really, really didn't like it and people who were in the middle. And that just felt like, okay, I can at least, and maybe I can't tell what size each of those groups are, but I can at least assume that they're those three types of readers. Um, and then look for evidence of when people loved it, how did they love it? Mm -hmm. When people hated it, how did they, what was the thing that they, that they hated? Um, it wasn't always the same thing that the critics and people interpreting those texts thought it was, um, which was helpful. But then you also just get this um, multifaceted view of this book in the world. You know, it was published with certain ideas, it was written with certain ideas, but then it was received in a bunch of different ways. And that can be helpful um, for understanding it as a historical text. Just as an example, I think um, Left Behind turned out to be really, really important to a lot of emergent church people. Hmm. It was almost a, an er text of a lot of emergent church people as an example of what they didn't like. And it hmm. was a really ready example. It was widely available. Um, 
but in some of the studies of the emergent church left behind comes up as much as any like overtly emergent church book as a touchstone of the movement so if i'm just trying to describe evangelicalism as it actually is that um reading that doesn't like it and doesn't agree with it turns out to be really important yeah yeah you know i think of my own i i i read left behind it just kind of as a not as a deeply religious experience more as an act of entertainment i think mm -hmm. um but of of the books that you surveyed and i've read them all <laughs> um it, it, love comes softly is the one i think that had more of a a long-term personal impact on mm. me and my religious imagination maybe because i came across it when i was quite young I think also maybe the, the context, um, my own church didn't have a church library, but I, I distinctly remember seeing that book in like every church library, every time mm -hmm. I visited, like it was, it was church library book. I, I'm guessing I got it at my Christian school library, um, picked it up and, uh, you know, it just, it really kind of, um, shaped my ideals of, uh, you know, looking back just what it would be, uh, you know, what it would look like to be a really, really godly woman mm. and, you know, being able to cook really good biscuits for your husband, <laughs> <It> was like <laughs> that, that scene of like her failure yeah. was just like mortifying to me as a kid who hadn't even like didn't even yeah. cook really, you know, maybe I made brownies from a, a box mix or, or something. And, and so it, it's fun. I, I read it, uh, read that book again, not too long ago and just, um, kind of rediscovering it and re-experiencing it now, you know, 30 years later, mm -hmm. um, and, and yet realizing that of all of, of, of these books, you know, that one in particular kind of burrowed more deeply, um, uh, into my religious formation and gender formation, I think as well. That's really fascinating. I can imagine the age being super important. Um, I think the gender, probably it addressing you as a woman and as a mm -hmm. Christian woman or a potential Christian woman. Yeah. Um, that book is also so fascinated with chores. Yeah. I've never read a book that has so much like, as she was trying to cook dinner and take care of the baby at the same time. And that's the dilemma. Oh, absolutely. And, it, and on the one hand, it's, um, it is inviting you to imagine something that's not your experience, assuming you don't live on the prairie and that you know, you're in the 20th century or 21st century. Um, and yet it's also so close, right? It is also asking you to sort of take the ideas of the main character and reimagine them into your own lived experience, which, which can be so powerful. And that's something you find again and again in these books is that they're they're realist in that way that they're trying to um, to invite you to play with these ideas and take them on and try them on in the world that you live in. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, let me, let me think. Um, I had another uh, question about kind of the uh, the the critical uh tone that you you took and at, at points in mm -hmm. the narrative seemed to withhold you know uh earlier in this conversation you talked about kind of owning your identity as evangelical the good and the bad and mm -hmm. and that, that was important to you as i read this book i was initially struck uh by just how kind of even-handed your your approach is uh, uh and almost anthropological in some sense uh and, and in part i was probably contrasting it with the tone of my own jesus and john wayne you know they they, mm -hmm. they read a little bit differently i think sure. it's fair to say and uh um and and so I was appreciating that. Yeah, you know, there's these different approaches that scholars can take to um, evangelical culture uh, and evangelical popular culture. And then I turned the page to the conclusion, and it mm -hmm. seemed like you developed a little bit more of a critical edge there in that conclusion when you when you link to how these works of fiction, although not on the surface. Uh, appearing to be political, in mm -hmm. fact, did prepare people 
uh, in some fundamental ways to accept and embrace somebody like Donald Trump as their political champion, your words, right? Mm -hmm. And and it felt like there was there was a much more critical edge there. I wonder if you could speak to that um, as you were, you know, presumably you started this research you're writing before Donald Trump was on the horizon as evangelical hero. Uh, how did you kind of navigate that as you wrote, as you edited, as you kind of returned to this project? And was that a struggle for you? Did you feel like maybe you needed to rewrite in a more critical way or, or um, you know, how did you come to that decision to, to still even handed and yet a kind of critique, not so subtle critique in uh, the, con the conclusion to the book yeah it's something i wrestled with and i don't know that i came to the right conclusion i still wrestle with it i guess and it's too late now but um yeah i, I should know. say this is not a critique this is right no, you know we're all making a, these choices but yeah. it is a, i feel like it's a slightly unusual choice to sort of <laughs> wait until the conclusion to be like oh no i have some critical things to say um <laughs> I mean, I find that dispositionally, what I want to do is take stuff that people are already critical towards and then move the move my reader, move my interlocutor to not just dismiss it, but think about it more carefully. I don't I don't think that's the only way to do it. I don't I think you know there's lots of great stuff that says like um, clarity and fierceness is the way to go. Um, but what I find that I'm good at and that what, what compels me is this like attempt to move people to be empathetic towards stuff that they're not naturally empathetic towards. So that's just sort of um, where I started. And I think that's even a reason I wrote about popular novels that for the most part are not considered respectable and that people don't take serious. And um, yeah, I found myself drawn to that. But then I did at the end feel like um, maybe people deserved if they'd given me this much time to hear from me a little more directly. Like I wasn't, I didn't want to be coy. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to withhold. There were like mm -hmm. methodological reasons to take that approach. But then I was, I just, there was a sense that I needed to say, um, oh no, this has clearly had some bad effects um let's talk about them mm -hmm. um at the same time trying to separate in that conclusion um the answers to the question from the from the question I felt like one thing I could say is that um I feel like the way evangelicals have answered the questions of these books led them to support Trump but that's not quite the same thing as that the question of the book led them to support Trump. And so I was trying also to present contingency again, which I think is just so hard for most of us to just kind of hang on to as a concept. So I was just trying to say, here's a, here's a more critical edge. It still ends up emphasizing the contingency that, that there are lots of forks in the road in the history of evangelicalism. And if, you know, as an evangelical, I think if we understand clearly why we took the, this fork in the road, then we can maybe understand how to take a different one in the future. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. a, a useful strategy. So as I came out, maybe to just summarize what I'm saying, and I'm thinking out loud here, um, I did come out as critical but also to emphasize the same point that I thought I was making throughout, which is mm -hmm. how much the structure of evangelicalism matters and how much we should pay attention to contingency rather than just the essence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking of structure, I, you know, uh, your, your discussion of Christian Booksellers Association, you know, mm -hmm. in mid-century and, and the, uh, 
you know, connecting to government loans and suburbanization and just these little bookstores popping up across the country and, and how that ended up um, redefining the market, right? Shifting from denominational publishing to this you know, more emphasis on Christian living. I just thought that was, was absolutely brilliant. And, um, you know, if you could just uh, speak a little bit more to that and, and maybe, you know, one or two other of these, these kind of market shifts this uh, that that you highlight through this book and I think is a really important contribution you know many readers are probably like oh evangelical uh, evangelical fiction I want to I want to read about left behind and and, yeah. and and you'll get that in this book and it's it's fabulous but then you're gonna get this this um, uh, kind of deeper structure as well yeah as a writer this was the huge challenge because the narrative arc of the book is the arc of the market mm-hmm and yet each book is about totally different stuff than the book before. Yeah. So there's this disjunction with each chapter in the continuity of how the market is changing, uh, which to me ends up being a story about how very different things hang together as evangelicalism. Very, very, they don't go together, but they do because the structure holds them together. Um, yeah, so the narrative of the market is um, pre-World War II, it's mostly denominations, right? It's Methodists and Mennonites. Methodists don't sell the Mennonites and Mennonites don't sell the Methodists. They might want to, but they don't even know how, with a couple of exceptions. Um, but then you get this um, fundamentalist culture, which goes by the name fundamentalist, and that creates these new opportunities, including um, some camps, that tends to be a key point. Um, so it might be that like all of the Presbyterians go to Winona Lake in June and all of the Methodists go in July. They might not be literally mixing, but because they're all at this one place in Indiana, you can have a bookstore that sells to, to both groups and creates this sort of community and identity and broader conversation. Uh, the next, um, and that leads then to the post-war birth of the CBA and the birth of the Christian bookstore. A couple of points after that where we see changes is when publishers find their way into other bookstores, mass markets. And initially they just do one at a time. It's like little, they pop up. Um, there's limited space. And then the big innovation there is Walmart. When I, when I found this, which, um, is mentioned briefly in Bethany Morton's book to serve yeah. God in Walmart. And I'm just like, wait a minute, I need to know more about this. This is really important to my story. <laughs> um, yeah, so the religious, there was a bunch of religious right groups that boycotted Kmart, um, which I've run into a bunch of evangelicals who were like kids in the eighties who were like, why were we mad at Kmart? I don't remember, <laughs> like they remember that, but it's like, what was the issue? And the issue was that Kmart so Kmart's parent company also owned a bookstore that sold some um, pornographic literature. And so boycotting the bookstore didn't actually have much effect, but boycotting Kmart put pressure on the parent company. So this is happening um, in the um, early 90s to mid 90s and Walmart realizes that this is a great opportunity. And so they start stocking some Christian books to speak to this audience, to communicate to this group of people, our values are your values, um, which is also good value. And you should then shop here. There's this great little merging of uh, good values and things being affordable. So that's that. That's a huge turning point in the middle, in the, in the mid nineties. And it's also the reason that Left Behind becomes a bestseller. Like it's not a bestseller until it's sold at Walmart. And then a later um, um, transition in the market that's super interesting is with The Shack, which is the last book I look at, comes out in 2008 and it's self-published and it can't find a spot on the market. There's sort of no interest, uh, partly for theological reasons and partly because it's kind of, um, 
it's kind of a mess of genres too. I think publishers, people who are sort of professional book people are like, what is this a crime novel? Is this a supernatural novel? Like it's just, it's, it's a bunch of different things all at once, which never seem to bother readers, but I feel like professional huh. publishers got really upset by that. Um, but it sold, it sold initially on a podcast and that's the, that's the, and then there's this new thing called Amazon. And so it becomes a Christian bestseller at the same time that it's like breaking the market or showing how the, the distinctly evangelical boundaries of the market that we've known are, are, are breaking apart for technological and cultural reasons. Yeah, so that's that's where I, I kind of wanted to to end up here because uh, you know the the market has been so disrupted. You know, just in the last five six years, our local Christian bookstores here in Grand Rapids have mostly gone out of business, mm -hmm. uh, which for me as a scholar of evangelicalism uh, made me really sad. You know, I used to go in uh, to Christian bookstores every month or two. Just, mm -hmm. just take a quick look around and take the pulse of evangelicalism totally. and like, okay, what, what, what are the end caps right now? What's selling? What, you know, what kind of uh, home decor? What, you know, what are we looking at? And then just kind of walk back out and, and, um, and it's much harder to do that now yeah. Uh, because yeah, you know, you could go to Amazon, you can go to, um, uh, you know, look at, um, you know, sales rankings and, but it's, it's not the same kind of cultural space and community space. And it's, it's just much harder to, to track. And then we've got social media and we have TikTok, and I mean, you mentioned podcasts too. And I think that that podcasts in evangelical spaces have really had a democratizing force. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we opened with you talking a little bit about the, the lack of, of gatekeepers and that this is really a, a kind of democratic movement, evangelicalism generally, and, and feels like uh, social media has, has kind of uh, fueled that democratization in the 21st century in new ways um, mm -hmm. and, and, and given more workarounds to traditional gatekeepers like Lifeway Christian Books uh, or even Christianity Today, right? That sure. there, there are just so many more voices out there and so many more platforms. They might be small platforms, but multiplied by a thousand or 10,000, it, it, it kind of, uh, it's its own distribution network or networks. Um, so, so how would you characterize our present moment and, and what do you see um, ahead of us and and I, I always push back when interviewers ask me the historian to talk about the future <laughs> so mm -hmm. like, hey I don't know um, you know that's not my line of work but uh, I'm doing that to you now you know like, this, sure. this moment now the disruptive market forces uh, where do you see those going and then what are the implications for evangelicalism I mean I I don't I don't see the trend reversing. It feels like the multiplication of networks and the fragmentation of a single evangelical identity is only gonna continue. I do think that the, like, currently there are a lot of people that I think have been evangelical either in their own self-understanding or would have been considered evangelical um, in previous generations and previous years who kind of don't know now. They're like, I'm not, I don't, I just don't know. I'm not sure. I think that's part of this, right? There isn't a, there isn't um, the same coherent unifying structure um, that they're, that, that used to hold together again, a bunch of like kind of conflicting things. Um, I don't see that reversing. Um, it could, I just don't know what on the horizon I think there's a similar trajectory with sort of the the retirement and then the death of Billy Graham. You know, there was a sense of like, well, we all identify with him at least partly, yeah. you know, and maybe I'm as a Methodist closer than my neighbor is as a as an evangelical Episcopalian, but we can sort of all I'd gather around this um, celebrity and that's the thing that holds this identity together. And for a while people kept talking about like who will be the next Billy Graham. And the answer is like, 
well, there will be 10 smaller Billy Grahams. Like there isn't one person there. It's, it's niche marketing, it's specialization. And so, you know, there are more reformed people over here and more Pentecostal people over here and more um, like people who feel like this form of church structure is the most important facet over here and people who don't care about church structure over here. And I think that'll just continue. Um, and one side effect of that might be that the, the big rallying points tend to be political. I mean, at the same time that evangelicalism has fractured in a bunch of different ways, um, Americans have stopped caring about regional and lo local politics. Um, I noticed this when I was a reporter and I would cover like local government and in the early 2000s and the, the city councilman would be debating the potential in a city council election, they'd be debating their position on the Iraq war. And I'm like, the city council doesn't vote on the Iraq war. Like, why are we talking about this? But the reason they're talking about this is this is how our identities are formed, right? National politics can, we can all be a Democrat or a Republican or a Republican who likes this Republican or that Republican. And that is a reference point that we all use. So it does seem to me that there's a, a politicization that happens to at least pieces of the evangelical identity. Um, which I don't think is great, but <laughs> that seems to be what's happening as we, we as are. we watch it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, thank you so much, and um, I mean, thank you for the book. It is it's a really fun read, uh, kind of a, a trip down memory lane. I think for some of us and for others, uh, just a window onto a world that they may have never known existed, um, and then of course. Uh, underneath all of that, just a super smart kind of analysis of how we can think about evangelicalism and how we can think about um, modern religion. So uh, yeah, thank you and, um, and great work. Thanks so much. And thanks for asking me some questions. And thanks to both of you for participating in this. Uh, Daniel's book is Reading Evangelicals. How Christian fiction shaped a culture and a faith. And of course, Christians is Jesus and John Wayne. How white evangelicals corrupted a faith and fractured a nation. Not available at Christian bookstores, as you will read in Daniel's book, because they don't exist anymore, but wherever better books are sold. <laughs>